Hello and welcome to Zafshin Ratatsi and Yvonne Ridley joining you from on board HMS President in the heart of the English capital. And the theme today is fighting for justice and those seeking it range from the mother of a young man who was in prison fighting extradition to America to an entire nation trying to unchain itself from the shackles of tyranny. We also fly the flag for the Queen's cleaners. It seems they're fighting for equal pay and fair wages in the week that British taxpayers forked out millions for the royal wedding and find out why Manchester United, arguably the best known football club in the world, has been asked to honour the memory of a teenager slain by security forces in Bahrain. Plus, this former soldier comes on board to talk about his brother in arms thousands of miles away in a military prison in the United States. And one of Libya's spiritual leaders gives an exclusive interview revealing his interpretation of the people's uprising there. All of this and so much more, so stay tuned to the show which rocks the boat. Our first guest is the campaigning mother of a young man who's been held in a British prison for five years fighting extradition to the US. American intelligence say a Chechen website run by Tala Asan helped fund terrorism, but she says the charges are baseless and British anti-terror officers certainly say they have no interest in taking him to court here. Far from being a dangerous man, Farida Asan says her son would rather pick up a pen and write poetry than wage war. So before we speak to her, here is a rendition of one of his works from a collection of his poems which have recently been published in a book. He and his mother used to make paperclip chains, with the ones covered in coloured plastic lacquer. She did it because she regarded such things as the most ridiculous things in the world. Did they somehow wish that they would impress their superiors holding together a report four days late? He did it because he liked the reds, greens, blues and the yellows. He liked the feeling of linking one to the other with metal ends causing bloodless indentations on his fingertips like mother's hands. They would then hold them out, however many, maybe fifty, a hundred. She would laugh a while, stop, stagger to bed and collapse. The next morning she would scream at him to undo every single one. Farida, your son has been in prison for nearly five years now without trial, without charge, fighting extradition to America. He's accused of uh, terror-related offences. What has he done or allegedly done? I don't believe all these things. I, I believe all that lie and made up. Someone tried to trap my son. I don't know who or you know what, but one thing I do know, my son is very religious at the age of 12, practiced Muslim, but he's a very, very kind person. One thing I can keep the guarantee. I mean, he's never even been to America, has he? Although no. he did run some uh, websites and the servers were in America. Now then, he's uh, written a book of poems, uh, This Be the Answer. And, and uh, did he just start writing poetry when he was locked up in prison? Well, it... Poetry writing is his childhood habit. He used to write in a school magazine and he used to show me a few poetry, you know, like a one day pigeon was making sound. He wrote a poetry, you know, and he was reading to me about that pigeon sound. So this uh, few poetry he wrote in uh, his prison and we encouraged him to publish it, you know. I was going to say, you, you visit uh, your son every Sunday. Every Sunday. But now, five years later, I mean, what what is there to hope about? I understand it's the European Court of Human Rights, because mm. the court system here has failed, according to you. Yes, that's why it is my crying message to the world. My son is innocent. And one thing you should know, that he is Sayyid family, he's in diluted family from my Prophet Hazrat Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Shayyid family is the harmless person. They are zero tolerance character because I married my husband seven, 47 years. It is their family character. They cannot do any harm. I, I, still I think there is something secret arrangement or something. What I don't know but I can feel it. Of course it is cruelty to a uh, young man inside the prison and his future and he was ambitious boy he wanted to do many things many good things you know 
Well, let's hope that your campaign for justice uh, bears some fruit. It's been going on for nearly five years now, and uh, obviously it's taking its toll. Farida, thank you very much for coming on board. Thank you for inviting me here. Thank you. The British-born US soldier Bradley Manning continues to polarise opinion around the world. The latest support comes from a former SAS soldier, Ben Griffin. Ben, who served in the UK's elite special forces, is well known in anti-war circles for his stance over the Iraq war. It earned him a lifetime gagging order from the Ministry of Defence. But that hasn't stopped him from rallying to support Bradley Manning, who has been accused of feeding the whistleblowing website WikiLeaks with sensitive information. This is what he had to say. Ben Griffin, you're a former Special Forces soldier. Uh, you spoke out against the war and uh, were actually gagged uh, by the Ministry of Defence later. Uh, there's a lot of empathy from you, isn't there, for Bradley Manning and his situation? Yeah, I've been campaigning um, for Bradley Manning for the last six months, uh, speaking uh, on his behalf, or not on his behalf, but speaking out for him. Um, I feel that he's uh, someone who's been victimised for um, allegedly leaking out the, um, all the stuff that went on WikiLeaks that showed us the true nature of the war, the Amer American and British war in the Middle East, in Afghanistan and Iraq. Because the way the authorities treat people like you and Bradley Manning is presumably trying to stop people like you and Manning doing the things that you've done. Do you think, do you think it works? Do you think whistleblowers and people against wars watch what happens to people like you and Manning and says, say, we're frightened. Sure, there's a, there's a theory that the, um, the, the treatment they're dishing out to Bradley Manning um, is all to do with trying to get him to, to break him down and get him to spill the beans on his relationship with Assange. But I actually think that it is more in that nature. What the, the United States government is trying to do is to show anyone, anyone in the forces in America who might be thinking about speaking out or maybe leaking some information or, um, you know, any, anything of that nature, this is what's going to happen to you. What, what is happening to Manning at the moment? As well, as you know? Bradley Manning, I think, um, was moved from Quantico to Fort Leavenworth. So he's moved from a, a marine base, a marine prison, to an army prison. Uh, the, the base that he was in was high security. He was on a, a suicide watch, even though he's, he's claimed himself that he's not feeling suicidal, which is the treatment that he's receiving basically amounts to torture. Whether that treatment is going to continue in Fort Leavenworth no one knows. There's two prisons in Fort Leavenworth. One is a high security, maximum security prison where convicted military criminals are kept. Um, one of the people who was convicted over Abu Ghraib is kept there. Uh, the other prison is a less security prison that is for people who are awaiting, um, awaiting trial. So we don't know which prison he's going to be sent to and whether this, uh, this suicide watch is going to continue. Do you think that uh, the US has been shocked by the overwhelming support, wave of support there has been for Bradley Manning from people like yourself? I think they've been more aggravated by it or found it irritating. You know, they think they've got a free reign. Uh, throughout the world, they think they've got a free reign on how to treat people in prisons all around the world. Now they're doing it to one of their own and people are complaining about it and uh, American lawyers are getting involved and, and peace groups And the, the British States. government, because he isn't one of their own, is he? He's also a British citizen. Well, he has got a Welsh mother and he went to school in Wales for a few years, so it, there is that British involvement there. And I think they've been irritated by, um, by the way that, that people have taken up Bradley Manning's case. Um, I think they expect people to, you know, follow the whole line about homeland security and this guy is a dangerous risk, you know, the, the lives of soldiers are being put put in danger by this dangerous individual. Because arguably the United States government losing Hosni Mubarak, losing people in Tunisia, WikiLeaks was credited as being one of the many different catalysts for these revolutions. Surely it is to be expected the US president would be saying, we've got to get Manning because people like this ruin our plans for North Africa and the Arab world. Sure, but unfortunately for Barack Obama, the American state is supposed to be governed by the US constitution. And I think the Eighth Amendment and the Fifth Amendment both contradict, contradict what they're doing to Manning. You know, you can't be espousing freedom and be this so-called shining light of democracy throughout the world. You know, apparently the Libyans want to be just like us, whilst doing this to, to people in your own backyard. It, there's no consistency there with their arguments. Well, Ben, thank you very much for coming on thank board you. and good luck with the campaign. Thanks a lot for having me. Thank you. 
the Islamic Human Rights Commission is hoping football giants Manchester United will support their campaign to honour a Bahraini teenager who was shot in the head by government forces. Reza Qasim came on board recently to explain why. Raza, welcome to HMS President. This channel may be covering Bahrain, unlike a lot of the corporate media. Tell us about this particularly tragic case uh, of a boy shot in Bahrain. Um, this particular boy, uh, Ahmed, has been was playing outside his house, playing football outside his house. Um, he was playing with the Manchester United jersey on. Uh, wasn't involved in protest uh, or, um, at that point in time. Uh, suddenly, security forces arrived, um, and the, they shot him. And the father also saw that uh, they'd hit um, the boy with a pistol butt as well. And in, in a sense, he, he was killed as a result of the tactics used by the security forces, um, which seemed to be completely unwarranted against someone who's playing football outside his house um, uh, innocently. Because it could easily be Saudis, because of course they're occupying parts of Bahrain at the moment. Uh, what, what are uh, Muslim groups in this country doing to show solidarity with uh, those protesting Bahrain's government? I think there have been protests going on in um, a number of times outside the BBC in terms of raising the profile uh, in Manchester. I know there have been protests outside the Saudi embassy, the Bahraini embassy, and, and so on. And on top of that, I think the most important thing that needs to be done is uh, writing letters um, regarding this issue. And the fact that he was playing in a Manchester United jersey, I think this in, um, widens the remit of those people that can feel an affiliation for this boy who just was a Man United fan. I was going to ask you about that because Manchester United, world famous, probably the most popular football club in the in the world. Um, you're hoping that they'll hold a minute's silence on May the 8th for the match against Chelsea? Yes, I mean, that's something that really we really do want to um, try and get as many people to write into Manchester United um, to ask them to hold this minute's silence because after all, this boy, was all he was doing was playing football. He was playing um, in a Manchester United jersey at the time that he was shot dead. The pictures have been flashed around the world uh, with with him uh, lying dead in, um, in, in that way, in, in a Manchester United jersey. And uh, the club is known to have supported people who have died in tragic circumstances and I think as a responsible club, as someone who uh, takes its social responsibility based on things that they have said on their website um, about how they want the youth to develop and so on and so forth, it's important for a club of that stature to wade in and say, look, we really don't think what happened to this boy is acceptable. Will they write to, uh, have you got an email campaign going? Uh, yes, we've got a campaign and it's up on our website, um, www.ihrc.org. Mm -hmm. um, and on there, if you look up Manchester United and um, uh, there's a campaign, a number of people have already written in um, to Manchester United asking them to um, have this minute silence. And I think the, we're waiting for a positive response from Man United with because this. Britain has close ties with the Bahraini government. We don't even know whether the rifle or the gun that was used to uh, kill this child could well have been supplied by the uh, United Kingdom or the United States. Hillary Clinton, of course, saying she's close to the government. Doesn't that pose a problem for big businesses, which is, after all, Manchester United and uh, close ties between Western governments and the Bahraini government? That are, that are using security forces in this way? I think when there are big businesses involved and it, when, it's, when it's their personal interest, then I'm, I'm sure that big businesses, people of stature like Sir Alex Ferguson, will more than happily stand up for Man United. And I think in this instance, um, it's important that people who are the supporters, who are the rock bed of uh, Manchester United being the success that it is in, in, in some sense, um, are recognised when a tragedy befalls them. Thank you very much for coming on board, Reza. Thank you. So, Afshin, were you one of the two billion who tuned into the royal wedding? I watched a little of it. I wasn't arrested, at least, uh, the night before or during uh, the wedding proceedings because uh, the police were out in force. Mm, I heard that there were some preemptive uh, strikes. What were you doing? Where were you? Well, I went to Libya, where I can tell you the talk was not of the royal wedding. I was there for a few days and I did manage to speak to one of the spiritual leaders of the revolution, Sheikh Mohammed Basidra, and this is what he told me. Western military intervention has polarised uh, many of your supporters outside of Libya. How crucial is Western support to your victory? The Western part is a major one. 
The only thing because that if we look at the forces on both sides are not equal. So the battle obviously will be in the favor of our enemy. The intervention of the uh, of this uh, Western alliance, although up to now they are not very active, yet they've helped a, a lot, and I think they will be intensified, inshallah, in the future, and it will put an end to this regime. Now they've uh, introduced drones and manned planes. These are the same uh, drones that are killing civilians in. Uh, the tribal areas of Pakistan. It's a very controversial issue and of course these NATO forces that are helping you are the same NATO forces that um, are hated in, in parts of Afghanistan and Pakistan. How do you square with that? If we look at it from this point of view then we could have been slaughtered by now. So we are now looking for some reason to save ourselves, our women, our children, and old people. Now, they are doing badly there in Pakistan and, and everywhere they go. Here in Libya, to compare between them and Gaddafi, I think they are a lot better. Maybe up to now, they didn't kill many civilians, I can tell you. All have been killed are Gaddafi's followers, not supporters, but followers, soldiers and uh, officers, I can tell you that. And uh, it is the nature of the war, there must be victims. Where are the supporters coming from? Because they're not just uh, Libyans, are they, that are supporting Gaddafi? I've met some from Chad, others from Niger, from Mali, from Darfur, Algeria. And I've been told by those who I trust that some of them from Colombia and uh, from Belarus, Russia, Baida, Belarus, those of whom I've heard about. And there were some women in Masrata from Colombia. And what is their motivation? I think it is money. The, as long as they get money, they would come because they don't care about the Libyans and they don't look at it from whether it's right or wrong. They look at it from one point, whether it's worthy or not, in many ways. Now you spent more than 20 years in prison uh, because of your challenge over Gaddafi's authority. Uh, you know the brutality of the regime. What do you see as life after Gaddafi? The life after Gaddafi should be exactly the opposite to the life during Gaddafi's days. If not, I think we will be there at the court yard again. We will not allow anybody to do what Gaddafi has done to us. And this revolution started uh, in February with less than 20 youths. I found about 20 youths burning um, tire, car tire, and shouting. So I stopped to listen what were they saying. They were saying that people want the regime to, to, to fail. And they were trying to attract as many people as they can. And when I stood looking at them and asking myself up to where they would reach, they said to me, as they said, oh, Dad, come, it is your day to take part. So I had to come <laughs> to take part, only because I was shy to run away. And where was <clears> this? <throat> at Al-Bayla. When the police came, they straight away, they burnt one of the police car, And then they moved towards the uh, city center. Well, good luck with your revolution. You've been waiting for this. Thank you very much. I think we've been waiting for this for 20, 42 years. 42. Yes. Well, we couldn't do today's show without a royal story. 
Yes, we bring you an exclusive, which has been overlooked by the mainstream media, monarchists, and it seems the Queen herself. Cleaners who polish the palace for the Queen claim they're being exploited. Joining us with the full story is union organiser Lizzie Woods. Welcome to you, HMS President. What's the PCS union and how uh, unionised are the palaces anyway? I'm an officer for the Public and Commercial Services Union. Um, we represent 280,000 members working across the civil service um, in Whitehall, in the government, in the royal palaces, uh, museums and galleries, the coast guards and the passport agencies. So a very wide range of our workers and as you no doubt no a very wide um, well all our members are under attack um with well they're probably the, on honeymoon now but where uh, prince william and uh, his wife lives or is it the duke of cambridge who's cleaning there um well today our members will be hard at work cleaning up after the royal wedding um on a rate of six pounds 45 an hour now you know um, irrespective of what your feelings are about the monarchy, whether you're a monarchist or whether you're a Republican, you know, I challenge anyone with a shred of moral decency in their body not to sort of sit back and um, be quite appalled at the breathtaking hypocrisy where the British taxpayer has paid out £30 million annually to the royal household for its upkeep. And yet, and, and the wedding has cost an estimated £100 million of taxpayers' money, gen, you know, mostly. And yet we are um, uh, workers at the Royal Households who work very hard at getting paid 6 45 an hour. Now, these are men and women, and uh, they're all members of the PCS. Is it directly the Queen's fault because aren't they employed by a private contractor? Um, well, it is the responsibility of the Royal Households because, yes, while they do work for private contractors, the Royal Household awards the private contracts and the Royal Household um, pays them to conduct a service, to carry out a service and to oversee the contracts and to manage the staff. Um, so, you know, while there are, they are working for the, uh, the contractors, the Royal Household has ultimate responsibility. And so, yes, the Queen is responsible for the well-being of these workers. Can we just put this into perspective as well? Because... Uh there are viewers out there who are earning less than a dollar a day and so they'll think that ten dollars uh, an hour is uh, is a fortune. Um, well yes of course I mean the cost of living in London is extremely expensive um, you know um, so I mean, I, I believe personally that on an international basis, all workers deserve a decent living wage. That's the bottom line. Life in Britain is extremely expensive. The recommended living wage for London is £7.45, which is endorsed by the Mayor of London. Personally, I think it should be more. Um, however, you know, here we have a position, a situation where a Conservative mayor actually endorses £7.45 an hour. It just goes to highlight just how moderate but that have, demand is. So you have the mayor on your side. Why, is the, why are the royal palaces not saying, OK, we agree with the democratically elected mayor? And why have you had such difficulty with the, the royal household in organising this? And the media hasn't been covering it either. Well, you know, your guess is as good as mine. I mean, while the correspondence that we receive from the royal family says that they don't have the money to pay 25 workers the recommended wage for London £7.85 and yet have the money to pay to spend £100 million a year on a royal wedding, um, you know, your guess is as good as mine. Well, we should have the Queen on to explain <laughs> in a future episode of this or, programme. Or maybe somebody from the palace would like or to comment, but uh, Lizzie Woods, I have a feeling we'll thank be you. seeing a lot more from you about this story. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. If you want to know more about today's guests, go on to our website, www.retanceandridley.com. And don't forget, we're also on Twitter and Facebook. See you at the same time, same place next week.